Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this event, Oil and Gas as the Next Climate Frontier, just transition from black and green. This event is co-organized by Climate Strategies, Stockholm Environment Institute, State of Green, and Carbon Tracker. My name is Andrzej Bohovic. I'm Managing Director of Climate Strategies. Um, we all know that this COP has been full of announcements, commitments, and action on fossil fuel transition. Uh, and that just illustrates how much work will be needed to implement that. And actually, our project, Oil and Gas Transition, that is uh, co-hosting this, is launching three country reports for the UK, uh, Norway, and Denmark today as we speak. So you, you see the, country, the, the QR codes available uh, on, this, on the walls of this pavilion where you can download uh, the report. Uh, we have an honor to have um, Thomas Christensen, who is the Denmark's climate ambassador, uh, to open the event. So, Thomas, I give you the floor because I know you have to move on to important negotiations and meetings. Thank you very much, Andre, and, and thank you to um, Climate Strategies and the Oil and Gas Transitions Project, but also to your, to your partners who have uh, helped organize uh, this event, including State of Green, where we are. Um, the topic that, that uh, we're talking about here is oil and gas transition and the uh, new Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance that Denmark uh, will be launching. Uh, unfortunately, not today, but tomorrow we had to uh, give away our conference, press conference room to, um, to the UK for a press conference with Boris Johnson. Um, but um, make no mistake, we will be in even stronger force tomorrow. And I can tell you that as we stand here, we are still rallying uh, new members. We are in uh, deep conversations with more uh, both governments and uh, sub-nationals uh, about uh, joining and um, if uh, any of you in the audience either here in the room or, or uh, streaming this event um, uh, feel encouraged to maybe give a large ditch effort to uh, being part of the launch tomorrow I would very much welcome your your declaration of intent uh, we have to go through a due diligence process to um, to bring you on board as members but uh, uh, we still have a few hours to do that, and there's a whole team here in the Danish delegation room uh, working hard on on um, on preparing the launch. Um, but just uh, let, before I get to what Boga is about, just a few uh, words about where we are at. We are at COP26. It is the conference of the parties to the Climate Convention and to the Paris Agreement. We are entering the final phase of negotiations. Um, the UK presidency has uh, this morning at seven o'clock put forward draft uh, cover texts, uh, the main decisions, political decisions um, that uh, um, combined uh, set the stage for the final negotiations and with a, with a very bold attempt from the UK to set a high bar of high ambition in terms of keeping 1.5 degrees alive. And, um, uh, Denmark with Grenada has played a role in, in leading on the consultations amongst ministers on the mitigation part, the 1.5 part, um, and uh, that's why I will have to run out in a few minutes because we, we have to meet with uh, Boris Johnson and the, and the UN Secretary General and, uh, and uh, our role is not over yet, so uh, I can't tell you any, any more, but um, it is, uh, it is uh, a quite exciting uh, period uh, of this uh, of this COP, um, but clearly this um, this uh, document that the UK has put forward tries to set that level of ambition, that high bar, uh, will also need the support from all of you. I think it's important that civil society, that uh, that NGOs, that the whole community, uh, also of private sector, comes out in force and makes clear that uh, that this is what you expect from governments to send the right signal to uh, to the world, uh, to civil society, but also very importantly to industry and, and the private sector that this is uh, the inevitable direction that the globe, global community, that uh, politicians, but also the global economy is taking on energy transition, on the just transition from fossil fuels to uh, renewable energy. And um, uh, in the current draft, there's actually a reference to fossil fuel subsidies and the phasing out of coal, which might be the first time in a draft like this that we have that kind of text. Let's see if it survives the final round of negotiations but at least the intention from the UK presidency to put this on the agenda uh, squarely is, is, is there. Um, when we leave here on Monday, we will all have a great uh, task in terms of implementation in advancing everything that has been uh, agreed here, but also in advancing 
the initiatives that have been launched on the transition from fossil to, to renewable on the 1.5 degree trajectory. And the BOGA initiative um, is one of those initiatives. And uh, um, we won't have a large, uh, a large uh, number of members when we launch tomorrow. Uh, the final tally might be in the sort of 10, 15, 20, depending on what happens uh, today uh, uh, from both the national and sub-national. But it sends an extremely important signal to the global community of setting up a, a group of uh, ambitious governments who declare that they are ready to align oil and gas production with the Paris Agreement to end production aligned with gas uh, with the Paris Agreement. It sends the signal to everyone that this discussion has come to stay, that it is on the table, and in that sense that the fossil, fossil age is moving towards its end. Its end. It's a managed transition. It will take a long time, but we are now starting in earnest the conversation on it. And BOGA, it's our ambition, will be the place where we can have that um, quiet diplomatic conversation with large producers about their transition and what a transition trajectory looks like, but also a just transition that takes care not only of the economics, but also of the social and environmental dimension. And you asked, Andre, what did we do in Denmark? What, what was the, what's the Danish story? Well, the Danish government in 2019 decided to end um, oil and gas production and not to issue any more licenses, new licenses. Um, that means that the current set of licenses will, will uh, be able to run until they expire. Uh, we don't know exactly when that will be, somewhere between 2040 and 2050 pro probably. But as part of that agreement uh, was also an agreement with the with the um, with the unions and with the companies in our main um, oil and gas port in Esbjerg about the a gradual transition of the workers and of the on of the port from uh, oil and gas industry to offshore wind carbon capture and storage to um, uh, basically the new green economy and I think as an inspiration for other countries that go through that thought process that analysis but also uh, the political discussions. Um, uh, we would very much invite people to come and talk to us to uh, maybe uh, have a discussion on our example, whether that's helpful for them, um, whether that can uh, be inspiring. Um, and we know how difficult it is to take such a decision when you actually, as the Prime Minister puts it, you leave a billion of dollars in the ground. Um, and uh, and uh, we think it's necessary. We, th we, we believe that the North Sea will transition from a, a fossil fuel uh, ocean to a renewable energy and offshore wind um, ocean and um, and uh, the Danish parliament is behind this notion uh, the the law uh, putting this into law was was proposed in parliament uh, I think last week or the week before and um, we are now on that trajectory and uh, being here in Glasgow to launch this uh, initiative is really a, a dream come true I think for for the minister and um, as I said, we look very much forward to engaging all of you in, in this initiative. We will need uh, everyone's support. Um, but also, if you, uh, if you think uh, this is an interesting yeah. conversation, you have the possibility as a country, but also as an organization, to become a friend of BOGA. Uh, as a friend, you, don't, you haven't taken the decision yet, but you want to be at the, the table you, know, uh, uh, you have to uh, sign the declaration saying that you will eventually align with uh, with the Paris Agreement in your production and, and uh, towards um, scaling it down and ending it. Um, but we do very much see this as a as a as a trusted space of a conversation of outside the limelight of, of politics and, and the media uh, for that managed transition that we believe eventually all major oil and gas producers and everyone else has to go through. With that, Andre, I will rush off. Um, and leave you to the excellent panel you have and, and thank everyone very much for coming here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I couldn't think of a better sort of introduction to this event where, and actually now I'm going to tell you a bit of the, about the game plan. Uh, so our agenda is divided into two parts. One is the Danish case, we want to really dive Deeply into dive deeply into the, the sort of the private public partnership that led has led to where Denmark is now, and then later we'll have a presentation of our research project oil and gas transition in the North Sea, and then we will have a panel to discuss about co-creating evidence and pathways 
in the North Sea, but also beyond. So hence, you know, we will have a lot of local Danish context and a lot of very global context beyond uh, developed, I mean, Annex One countries. So I'm going to do maybe a bit of reorganization here so that I'm going to move that a little bit so that the panelists have space here. And I am going to invite the first panel. So I'm inviting uh, Mikkel, Anne, and Emil to, uh, to the stage. You all should have your, your uh, headsets, I think. And I'm going to give you this microphone and I'm going to use the other one too. Right. COVID COPS makes us you know, adjust to all the technology. Right. So this is the first panel called Black to Green in Denmark, a public private imperative. So the way how we, we discuss it with our panelists is we post a few questions to them. So they, I mean, there are four questions and we would, we, we are kindly ask you to kind of reflect spiritually on those questions in your interventions. One is why and how could Denmark achieve what no other country has been able to achieve? And we heard from uh, ambassador already the big picture, but you know, we want to kind of hear from you guys how in reality it was done. Then some details on this private public collaboration. The third one is the biggest challenges because we know the, the picture is not as sweet as, as, as the, the official story. We know that so we want to, to tease you and to challenge you to, to share some of the difficulties and whether you think the, the transition uh, is just because this is you know, another buzzword that is very often used at the COP is this just transition. So the question is, is it really just? So um, let me start, sorry, I'm just kind of flipping all my papers here where I have the secretive questions. Uh, some of them I shared with uh, the panelists, but yeah, so hopefully you won't be surprised. So the first um, panelist is Mikhail Simelsgaard, who is the COO of the Rumble. And Rumble is a consultancy. Uh, so that's why, um, you know, um, I'm interested knowing that consultancies must be very efficient. So that's why I was asking Mikhail, could you share any practical experience, you know, on this, your Den the Danish context from working with various types of stakeholders? Because that's what Denmark is saying to the world, you know, we, we really truly achieved the stakeholder engagement and buy-in. So please share uh, experience on that front. Well, uh, Mikhail Simsko uh, from... What is Maybe closer. A bit closer. Does that help? Um, I think when, when you look at Denmark, then what we are looking at is a very, very strong collaboration between the governmental side and the private side. So what we are looking at is, of course, that we have invested in the wind industry, we have invested in areas which then can be offsetting. Of course, the changes for the, a lot of lives for the people living in Esbjerg, as Thomas alluded to earlier, but actually, the clarity we now have, meaning that no more concessions, we know that the transition will come. So what we're looking at now is actually we have very, very competent uh, engineers. We have very, very wide staff in the areas, which we are now very, very hardly working to reskill for the new things. Because actually, there is not that big a difference between gas when it's hydrogen or gas when it actually comes it's still run in pipes yes there's some density differences but what we are really looking at is the clarity and the long term makes it easier for us to actually start the transition because the easy decision for us would have been let's just shut down all let everyone go to other industries and may I create the catastrophe in the areas but what we are doing is by having the foresight of where we are going, we have been able to basically transfer. So we are transferring. We have had an oil and gas division within a number of almost 1,500 people at a certain time, which is basically now transferred into supporting the green energy transition. So the outlook is, the, is, is some of the tricks behind the model. 
how was how was it like uh, perceived? Like was it was it like co-created, co-elaborated with the stakeholders? I mean, foresight is also another word that everybody says. Oh, we have to do foresight analysis. But was it easy from the beginning, or there were some sort of bumps on the way? I think we have a very good collaboration. There's a, a lot of strong associations that actually support that has been able to both influence so that it was doable from a private and a public side. All the ones orchestrating behind State of Green, if you look at Dansk Energy, if you look at Wind Denmark, if you look at all these associations and Oil and Gas Denmark has basically been part of making a transition and creating the transparency between the governmental side and uh, the, the, the private side. Who was the biggest? Who was the biggest troublemaker from your experience? You don't need to name the organization. I'm just curious, what type of stakeholders? Is it like labor unions or I don't know the very sector? I I, I actually don't think I can point out anyone specifically. I, I think it has been a very very strong collaboration. Yeah, you, Anne, you from DI has been active in 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 trying to orchestrate it. So I'm I I can't even point out one that was more difficult because. If you look at it, then even oil and gas Denmark, which of course in their name would have seemed to have a problem, is behind the transition, is behind what we're doing here. Of course, it is a big transition and we need the time uh, because other than that, the, the, there's somebody that are losing money and, and that's never good. All right, thanks very much, uh, Mikael. I we move now to the second speaker and we can, you know, hopefully you can still have a couple of exchanges. So our spe second speaker is Anne Simonsen. She's a senior director mm -hmm. for climate in the Confederation of Danish Industry. You know, the question when we discuss by email, which is, you know, like, and of course that's a cliche, but we know that in many countries that, you know, the, the confederations of industry are the biggest troublemakers, the biggest block, they're always opposing and stuff like that because some of the executives say, well, we have to make sure we please everybody, you know, even the most kind of challenging member. So I would really invite you on to share how have you managed to get that sort of consensus within what I imagine is a diverse group of, uh, of members and be the sort of, from what I understand also, you know, one of those supporters of the partnership. Okay, thank you. First of all, I'll tell a brief anecdote about what Denmark lived from and what than Danish businesses live from. In the 70s, we were totally dependent on imported oil. We changed the whole energy system into exploiting our own uh, coal and gas, but also, uh, sorry, uh, oil and gas, and also coal-fired power plants. We discovered it was an environmental problem, so we changed the system into more biogas and natural gas. We introduced wind in the system, and we have been changing the energy system all the way through. That is business opportunities. And that is why the Confederation of Danish Industries are among the green front runners. We supported a very ambitious Danish uh, carbon dioxide reduction target of 70% uh, uh, in comparison with 1990 in uh, 2030. And that is because that is business opportunity. So that is a brief story about that. The second thing is, today, if you want to have a perspective in your, in your company, you need to know your carbon put, footprint and you need to have plans to become greener, no matter what industry you operate in. It's a license to operate. So that's the second reason why it gives meaning to a business uh, confederation like us to support this strongly. The third thing is that we, need to be able to also provide for society's income in the future. And that is not going to come from, for example, oil, gas and coal in the far future. You heard the Danish climate ambassador stating clear and loud that Denmark is a leader in phasing out also the exploitation of oil and gas. And we support that, not from one day to the other, but a transition. If you go to the harbor he mentioned in Esberg, who are now uh, the, the main capital in Denmark for oil and gas, they are also a main capital for something else, for, for offshore wind energy. So that transition began 10 or 15 years ago and is already in place. It's not, uh, it's not uh, finished. We still have, uh, have different challenges, but we have proved that we can move that way. And some of the large companies, for example, Rampel, 
but also us that I'm sure we'll hear about that in a minute, that started as, as of Esperan Energy in oil and gas are now mainly into green offshore energy and some of the future energy uh, sources like power to x So that is the background. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I'm actually interested in this business opportunities, you know, because this is something, again, in every recommendation about transition, this sort of aspect is mentioned. So I'm really curious, do you think it's a Danish spirit, Danish uh, sort of entrepreneurial spirit, Danish sort of transformational spirit, or it's, I don't know, a blessing that you guys have, I don't know, wind? I mean, what, what is that? Or because, you know, I think every nation has some potential or a big potential, but is there something that you find, you know, is useful and replicable potentially for other sort of jurisdictions? When it comes to national resources or natural resources, Denmark has not traditionally been rich on that. It's been a hard job to exploit the oil and gas and nowadays the wind energy. But, but we, are not, uh, we are not very um, uh, uh, used to that things are easy. So we are on a constant journey to find the new ways to get our energy and to have our income. But if you ask what the magic word here is, it's public-private partnerships. It's a close cooperation in Denmark between companies, government, and also local communities, trade unions, for example. It's a small country, 5.5 million people. And I think that is part of the explanation why we're able to do it. Right. Thank you very much. I think it's, uh, let's move to, to our third panelist and then we will have a five minutes maybe for, for, for an exchange. So our, first, our th third panelist is Emil Gran, who is a lead for global public affairs at Orsted. And um, well, Orsted from you know, the bio note, uh, uh, Emil, I have about you was saying that basically you guys managed to convert yourself from the dirtiest to the cleanest utility. So my, when I read this, I was like, okay, uh, so I'm, I'm really curious because on, on one hand, it sounds like you are involved in so many initiatives, again, domestically and internationally. So could you share something about your investment decisions? So how could you, can you still do good business uh, while staying engaged and kind of co-shaping that transformation? Yes, I will uh, definitely try, try to do so. Um, and as you said, then we have transformed from one of the most fossil fuel intensive companies to now being ranked as the most sustainable energy company in the world. You're using really a proper terminology. Sorry, I was <laughs> proud about that. And, but for people that are regular hang, hang arounds in, in this pavilion, they'll know that story and it'll also take some time to tell. So I'll save you from that. But I, I brought this uh, paper that you can find online just to let people know that if you are curious about that, then come talk to me afterwards or um, search for uh, go to us the white papers and look at the it's, it's 20 pages about our business transformation. Then you'll get the, the full story. Uh, but under you asked about kind of what enabled our this these investment decisions and this transformation. Um, and I think I'd like to send a few uh, shout outs to, to different societal stakeholders and 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 uh, just accompanying what Anne and, and Mikael has been saying, then I won't kind of repeat what they've been saying, at least not trying to. But uh, when, we, when we talk about governments, what has been really important for us is that they were able to provide some clarity for us in setting uh, fairly ambitious uh, build-out targets for renewable en energy, namely offshore wind power. And that's not only in Denmark, that was also in the UK and in Germany. Because what did that do? That enabled us to provide scale to the um, to our kind of to our transformation to offshore wind power that enabled us to put an order to Siemens Gamesa for uh, 500 uh, offshore wind turbines which was more than had, that had been deployed uh, across the world at that time we could only do that because governments were creating some clarity in terms of uh, setting up new uh, new projects and uh, and demanding offshore wind power and of course also some support for a technology that at that stage was an immature technology and needed financial support. So we needed that certainty in order to be able to uh, invest uh, billions of dollars. Then also we haven't talked about institutional investors where Danish pension funds has also been, they have been um, a big, it has been a big help and they have been a big driver of this transition in Denmark that they have seen this opportunity, even though it, has, it was a, a, a new frontier and institutional investors, they sometimes, they, they tend to be fairly risk averse. 
which they should, you could argue, because they are handling uh, our pension funds, and uh, uh, and and we would uh, we would hope and agree that uh, that they make good use of the money that we uh, we uh, we rely them to handle. But so so them being open to to new areas that has also been really important. And and then I I actually also want to give a shout out to um, of course you can say the population, the citizens, the civil society, business organizations that have been pushing the government to do that. Uh, but also, if I can, if I can give a, a, a shout out to people in, in Ørsted, because it was before I, I, I went there, so I feel confident in, in giving a bit of uh, praise to, to ourselves, that there were some, there were high level management, they saw the need for change. And they also acknowledged that change happens exponentially. So even though we had the best uh, coal fired power plants in the world and the, and the best engineers, we had to let go of, of, of that darling, because we could see that the outlook um, I mean, no one would have imagined it going so fast with the green uh, kind of the, the policy changes, even though it's not fast enough, it simply went so fast. So um, internally also the acknowledgement of, well, it would be much easier probably at that time to uh, hope and rely on the fact that we could just continue with business as usual, but in the long term, it wouldn't be sustainable environmentally or financially. Wow, that's really very interesting. Now. I am attempt, I will attempt to maybe see if our audience has a question, but I still wanted to challenge the three of you because the picture is, I mean, I found some of the, many of the examples very useful, but there must be, I'm, I'm still looking for the sort of like, what hasn't worked so far? What is the biggest problem you see? So kind of to complete that transition that, you know, to deliver on the target. Could, could you just like in the same order, just say like literally a sentence on where do you see something hasn't worked or some sort of bigger, big, biggest risk that is, you know, in the next 10 years in your, you know, completing your kind of neutrality transition? You're not going to get me to find the, the wrong thing in the process up to now because it isn't there. Uh, because actually it has been a very, very deep collaboration in many things. And I actually think Anna's point on the fact that Yes, we have resources in the North Sea of oil, but the fact that we are a country where we are very much dependent on people and innovation, because if you look at it, we, we, have, we didn't have any coal, we, 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 we have wind, and we have oil. So if you look at it from that perspective, our biggest assets is exactly our ability to collaborate because we are a small country, we have no chance to do anything on our own so so in that respect our people is what actually ties things together and the knowledge we can transfer so i think the biggest challenge we are looking into is we need to repeat it again and then i will go back to espia and say okay if when, when I, I i come from the area the ones that are from denmark would know from my accent uh, that that that's back when i was young it was moving from fishing to oil and gas. The harbor was a classic fishing harbor. The transition has made oil and gas for a while the biggest employer of the harbor. Today, the biggest employer of the harbor is the, the wind industry. I'm sure with the ambitious target going forward, it will be hydrogen, it will be ammonium, it, uh, it will be the next thing which will be part of the energy transition and that is the spirit and the need to be able to transform and that is a challenge because we need to be able to repeat it again i think that's it for me. thank you Anna. thank you i think the the most dangerous thing that could occur now is the lack of being ambitious as you say the clarity of the framework for industry is important and the jobs, the income for Denmark, we uh, live from exports of energy technology and, and food and other things. But the lack of, uh, of, of jobs, skills will hit us if we, uh, if we are not ambitious enough. We need to develop the new green fuels. We need to, we need to be the best to uh, transform offshore wind energy into other fuels. We need to be the first country in the world that actually makes an artificial island that can assembly all that offshore. So the most, most dangerous things is that we slow down, we don't have clarity, and we come in doubt of the, the Danish strategy. 
that will uh, that will mean lack of jobs that will mean lack of climate uh, climate results and and that will be uh, where we see the the resistance to the road beyond as long as we move fast enough I, i'm not so i'm not so afraid I was about to say complacency, but now you said lack of ambition, and then I have to f have to f figure out something else. Then, uh, but because I completely agree, um, the, we 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 tend to tell ourselves in Denmark that we are world champions in, in everything in the in the green uh, areas, and and we are also in some areas. But that also it shouldn't it shouldn't uh, get us to rest on our laurels, and especially on on you talked about skills. That's also something we see not only within within Denmark, but but. I talked to our head of UK region, for instance, uh, the day before yesterday, and I mean, he's not too worried about whether the supply chain can follow in terms of delivering all the uh, the wind turbines and the green energy assets that we'll need to drastically the accelerate the deployment of renewable energy. But he's more he's more worried about kind of the the lack of skills because this is such an exponential change in terms of yeah the scale needed, and that also means the people needed, um, and the decisions we make now. They are, we, only, we don't see the consequences of, on them on an educational level uh, until, let's say, within a decade or so. So if, if, if we'll sit in, in, in 10 years, we can't turn back time and say, now we needed more engineers and we needed more, uh, more, uh, more, uh, more hands on the deck to deploy offshore wind turbines or business professionals. We'll need that now. So I think complacency and skills are uh, potentially big challenges. Super, thank you so much. Uh, now, I really wanted to offer our small audience here and well by the way I wanted to say to people watching online thanks very much for joining us I mean this is whoever joined it's always an honor you know that to attract your attention in such busy time is there any any quick question yes uh, could we thank you and if you could introduce yourself okay um Stanley Gwebiki Joma I'm a board member of uh, Climate Strategies. I'm from Nigeria. Um, very interesting conversation. And, uh, but I'm seeing that this is some kind of uh, a not-not conversation uh, that wouldn't sh give us the full picture. I'm saying this because Nigeria, in terms of uh, production and contributing to the problem, 11th on the list. And the oil and gas industry is key. And that is the backbone of the economy. And there is a double barrel transition ongoing currently. First level of the transition is the transition from government control to private control of the oil and gas industry. So the state's owned uh, NMPC is moving from government control to private control at a time we are in, in the midst of the global uh, energy transition. So I think that um, expanding this uh, circle to include Nigeria would, you know, kind of give um, some kind of full picture of this conversation. So what is happening in Africa with respect to economies that are dependent on energy, on oil and gas, how are they going to manage this transition? Are there lessons to be learned from what's happening in the global north, Norway, UK and, and Denmark? So I think that uh, probably going forward, this is really um, very important in terms of capturing the, 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 the big picture, the full picture, uh, 360 degrees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stanley. And uh, I think really we have 30 seconds. Then Mikel, if you want to intervene to, to respond no, to that. I, I just want to, uh, to respond that there's a good reason why we call it just transition. It has to be just and it has to be part of the, the complete, no doubt about that, but it shouldn't hold us back. So we need the nations that are where they are to move even faster. Nigeria should anyway learn of the technology. So when you are building pipelines across to over there to West Sahara and then up, make sure that it's at least built for the future and make sure that those things are included. And you can take very, very cheap solar in Nigeria and do what we talk about, power to X and other things, and be part of the transition in a different way. So I'm sure we can. Okay, thank you very much. I think we, we don't have any more time. And of course, you know, Stanley, there will be 
more of this conversation in the second uh, part of the event. So I want to thank our panelists. Thank you very much. And now uh, what we're going to do is set the scene for the second part. Uh, so I'm going here to invite Gokce Mehta uh, to talk about just transition for oil and gas in the North Sea lessons from Denmark, Norway, and the UK. That touches based on the reports that I mentioned that are being published as we speak. Um, just to say that Gokce has been a lead researcher on the project. She's also involved in an initiative that many of you may know, which is Leadership Group for Industry Transition Initiative, the so-called Lead It, and many other affiliations. But I think in the interest of time, Gokce, I should give you the floor. And then after Gokce's presentation, we invite our panelists uh, to the stage. Okay, um, thank you, Andre, and thanks uh, for the previous panel for giving us a little bit even more confidence uh, on what we're doing. I, 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 I'm happy to say that some of our findings are really aligned with what we heard. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a brief overview of, of the project that we are implementing together with uh, SSCI, together with Climate Strategies. Um, but if you want to learn more about what we are doing and our reports, they're available uh, via the uh, QR code, so you can download the reports. Um, indeed, so we are, uh, we are working on this project together with SCI and our local research partners, so University of Edinburgh, and we have a representative with us today, um, University of Oslo in Norway, and also uh, Aalborg University in Denmark. Now, our research is focusing on oil and gas transition. As we know, this is the next frontier in climate mitigation. Um, we are, have advanced in coal, industrial transition is also taking place. But as SCI's production gap report has shown that uh, there's a huge gap in climate ambition and action in the oil and gas area. And that's why uh, our project is developing an evidence-based uh, voice uh, and, and information that is aiming to catalyze action. So our project is really aimed at um, helping policymakers take, take the steps they need in the North Sea. And we focus on North Sea because as you'll see from the findings uh, of the report, that these are the countries that have the resources to, to take the lead and be front runners in the transition um, and show the pathway for others to follow. And we have a pluralistic approach. That means during the whole project, we engage with a great variety of stakeholders and we'll talk about co-creation in the next panel um, and this is really aligned with our framing which is based on just transition uh, because we believe that a transition is not successful unless it's just and we heard it a lot and our framing is based on SEI seven principles of uh, just transition and that can be also seen in the reports um, and these are the reports as I mentioned you can download them we've just launched them today so we're very uh, happy with that uh, and so, and I'll share a snapshot of what is in the reports. Uh, it's not the full, full picture, but hopefully we'll, we'll open it a bit more. Um, so when we looked at Denmark, we've discussed a lot about uh, the skills, uh, skill force and the need to reskill already. Indeed, there are opportunities in Denmark. Um, our um, authors from Albert University, the researchers found uh, many opportunities from technology relatedness perspective um, to, to carry the workers um, to low carbon uh, jobs, uh, but, and then there are of course um, already plans and availability of local facilities and offshore locations, uh, but indeed the lack of skills is quite evident. There, there's, a, there's a plan in Esberg region, a vision, and that education is quite central, but the lack of skills are still there. It needs to fall most, much faster. Um, the oil workers are, they have an age portfolio that is old, and. It, that's also another consideration taken into account. And one thing that really moved me in the first panel is that um, we mentioned that the transition has to happen quicker. And from uh, our interviews uh, with, with the stakeholders for the first part of the project, we actually found out that, uh, that it is feasible to, to achieve from the perspective of even the trade unions um, and net zero oil and gas industry in, in Denmark in 2040. So we'll be working uh, with our partners to explore that vision further. And when we look at the UK, the same, the opportunities are there. It's a country where it, it attracts a lot of investments. There's technological innovation. They want to be the world leader in innovation. Um, but at the same time, when we look at just transition, there, there are currently quite a lot of differences across the world nations of the UK. 
um, um, but at the same time, uh, the regulatory landscape in the UK is quite complex, but we are at a point where there, there are opportunities for policy interventions with the North Sea Transition Deal, the Climate Compatibility Checkpoints, so our project will continue to explore um, how we can help support policymakers uh, with a co-creative approach and building scenarios for the UK to achieve net zero 2050 oil and gas industries. And in Norway, once again, it's no secret, it's a rich country. Um, it has the financial availability, the knowledge and technology environment is there. Um, and we are at a, at a time post-election, there is an opportunity to um, embark on a constructive dialogue to end new operational licenses, new exploration licenses. Uh, but it is complex. It's a socio-economically very complex um, landscape and every citizen of Norway will be impacted. And when we looked at the government strategy on energy for work, we see that those socioeconomic considerations are not there. So we'll be exploring those um, and uh, in, a, in, a, in supporting a cross-sectoral dialogue in Norway. Um, and how we will do that, uh, this is our, um, the next stage of our project after the scoping studies. We'll do that through co-creation and uh, co-production of, uh, of scenarios with a variety of stakeholders from civil society, trade unions, public and uh, private, and help create that buy-in uh, among groups and using different methodologies. And it won't be, of course, the North Sea is also, as we see in the reports, there, there are different countries, there are different um, actors involved and different financial landscapes, so it's, it's, it's it's not going to be one size fits all, but we hope that we'll be able to draw policy recommendations for these countries um, building feasible pathways uh, for um, 2050. Um, and we've discussed uh, the question, we had a good question from Nigeria, indeed. Our aim is to then build um, lessons learned that can be adopted and implemented by countries uh, outside, within Europe, other countries outside the North Sea that are producers in, in Europe, and also outside Europe, and we also hope to engage and plan to engage with consumers because the transition will also impact them. That's from me, and this is how you can learn more about the project. And I look forward to the next step, next stage. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I think we can immediately move to the, the panel because Gokju is staying on the panel. So I'm inviting here Kirsten, uh, Lydia, uh, Kirsten, Lydia, and Mike. Um, and we're just doing a bit of reshuffle and we kickstart. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Exactly, that gives me more space here. You can move the table. I think the pavilion is quite cozy for, for this conversation. So, all right. Yeah. So, this is the part two that was kickstarted by, by Gokche which is essentially about co-creating evidence and pathways, right? Can the research accelerate policy action? That's what we are trying to answer here for the North Sea, but also beyond. So here comes again, the very, very right question from, from Stanley. Um, so Gokche, I start with you, sorry, uh, but, but this is kind of uh, quite, quite relevant. I want to tease you a bit because you know, you guys, SEI has been involved in researching just transition or energy transition worldwide. What is the recipe for success? Is it the quality of research? Are there committed stakeholders for co-creation? Is it maybe the timing or is it maybe the, 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 the methodology? Uh, I know you can say a mix of everything, but can you just like give us like one or two things where you think that was the trigger that something really worked out? Um, tough question. SCI is quite big. Uh, we do a lot of uh, great work. Um, I guess one example, and um, I think that there's no recipe for for everything. For each, of course, you know, we worked in, in different uh, locations as well. It depends, but I think, yes, buy-in from stakeholders is the most important, and it's the most difficult. Um, to be able to uh, bring different stakeholders into the same room and help them collectively imagine a transformation is a big challenge, but one that really works. Uh, because by doing that, it is not dictating this is what the research say. It is providing science-based uh, information, data, tools, methodologies to let the stakeholders come to the conclusions themselves. That creates the buy-in we need, I think, to move on. So that, that is sort of my recipe from my experience at SEI. 
Thank you very much. We come back to you, but now we, we move on to, to offer sort of a chance to introduce themselves to other panelists. So I'm happy to present Kirsten Jenkins, who is a lecturer at University of Edinburgh, and she's a lecturer on Energy Environment Society at the Science Technology Innovation Studies, so very uh, cross-disciplinary group. Um, and uh, so I, I would like to ask you about your reflection about the UK, which obviously you, see, you know it's uh, the report that you've been involved in, UK is the COP president. Uh, and there has been obviously this notion that you know there were all those declarations on coal, but not enough on oil and gas. So could you share us any sort of like uh, reflections on researching the oil and gas issue in in the UK or Scotland or you name it, like challenges? And you know, uh, what are your reflections on that? Yeah, I think it's a, a really really exciting time to be looking at this part of the world. Um, I think we have a huge amount to offer and. You know, without wanting to advertise it too much, we have a huge amount to say in that report, which we've just launched. Uh, so please do go and have a read. I think there are big opportunities here, but also some threats. There are opportunities around an upswelling of language around the just transition, an awareness of it, the appreciation of the necessity of change, and that can help us get the funding that we need, get the voices on board, uh, and the diversity that we're looking for. Um, and you know, make sure that we're not just representing one set of society. We're not just representing one technology as coal that we've heard so much about, but also that we are looking at these other sectors that do need to make the change and that can do this very rapidly. And so it's part of getting on board um, with our ambition as was sp spoken about in the first panel. And also I think asking really difficult questions. I think there are things that aren't spoken about within the just transition that need to be exemplified in more depth. And one of those is perhaps the notion that, yes, we can reskill our workforce, but we also need to bring in new entrants. If we were just to transfer what we have now, we have a very poor gender diversity. We have a very poor ethnic diversity. There are a great many other skills and peoples that can come on board as part of this. How do we recognize them? How do we engage them? And how do we make them part of a positive narrative? And at the same time, we talk a lot about workers, for example, but what about the people that have oil and gas in their homes? How do we make sure that it's a just transition for them and that they're not left without alternatives or without accessible, affordable alternatives? And so this is where I think, you know, this kind of group gives the most opportunity, but also needs to get to grips with those really nitty gritty details in context, which therefore give transferable skills, for example, Nigeria. Uh, thanks very much. I actually fa um, failed as a moderator to set the scene what questions, overarching questions we gave to the panelists. So why don't I do it quickly? So one is this role of research focus around analysis focus organizations. So I think that's kind of obvious, but also a question that I, I find interesting, can, res can action wait for researchers? So this is maybe, uh, I'll ask you, Kirsten, to comment, because we know that the pace of researchers is very long, and you know, sometimes, you know, we want to announced BOGA in two months and you have a research project that lasts three years, how do you reconcile that? And the third one is basically the sort of in, ensure, ensuring the inclusive range of voices, but for the kind of your analysis, right? Because you can obviously always do a stakeholder roundtable, but you know, to do, to do the proper analysis, you need this kind of structured engagement. But yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about this action waiting for researchers, if you could comment in one sentence. Yeah, we're not all that slow. Um, so one, one of the things to say is perhaps that a lot of the research does exist. Um, it's been going on for decades. It might use a slightly different piece of language. It might be called energy justice rather than just transitions. It might be called energy ethics. It might not be called any of those things, but certainly the discussion around a societal transition and one in which there are notions of equity, justice, and fairness go back to the 1960s and 70s. So we're not starting from a baseline of zero. We have an evidence base and all we're asking to do now is to expedite that, to increase the number of voices and to increase the extent of our coverage. Well, I think that's a really exciting thing. In terms of whether we are slow to act as researchers, we do like our leather armchairs, elbow patches and fireplaces, um, but also, you know, we are very active, we're engaging projects such as the one that we're doing with climate strategies um, and SEI, for example, have happened over a relatively rapid timescale and part of that comes through the support that's been given to us, but also the necessity of what we're hearing at events like this. 
we're talking about change now in some of our decisions by 2022. We're talking about higher standards um, of climate action, climate mitigation, um, and of attaining climate goals. And so we have to react to that as a research community. We're being incentivized to do so. We are capable, um, and we're really thankful for these kind of opportunities to expedite our work. Well, thank you. I don't think it's, it would be sharing too much if I say that, you know, the pace was even a challenge to the admin departments of the universities. But we are grateful, for, you know, <laughs> that this all is, is working out. Thank you very much, Kirsten. And then uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Lydia Dai, who is a youth activist uh, here at COP26. She's also a vice president of the UCL Climate Action Society. So we are very happy to have you here. Um, and it's also because, you know, we noticed, at least that's my impression, that the, the COP, there were the, the voices of the youth have professionalized, you know, but, but still, I think there are too many panels that you just invite somebody to tick the box. So would you help us understand how you see your role in, in that conversation? You know, obviously, we know this is all about future generations, like, but could you kind of mention a few things, engagements that you've done and, you know, how we could sort of work in practice in initiatives like this? Yes, awesome. Thank, thanks for having me here. Um, so I just wanted to address the um, point that was made before, actually in the first panel about um, having youth engagement and um, building pipelines in developed countries. So as we're all aware, we are not able to achieve the 1.5 degree goal without help from all stakeholders and from all countries, especially also develop, developed, uh, developing countries. And it was mentioned that oh yeah, we can just build a pipeline similar to maybe Denmark's in Nigeria. But the question is, how are we gonna do that? And who's gonna fund it? Um, I was wondering this because um, as my colleague who's not present here today, unfortunately, he's from Nigeria. And he told me that um, a lot of people from a lot of the companies from the Western world, from the developing countries, developed countries, for instance, Shell, they have their production sites in Nigeria and they're producing a lot of um, gas emissions, gas pollutions from, for instance, oil fracking, but they're not taking responsibility for that. So the question I wanted to ask is that, oh, um, it is nice to have net zero in developed countries, but are we counting the emissions abroad also towards the NDCs of our countries? And so I want to make another example. So for instance, China, as we all know, China is the largest polluter in the world. And has any of you never bought anything that is made in China? Please raise your hand. <laughs> okay, interesting. Yeah. So the point I want to make here is that a lot of the companies, in order to um, ensure really cheap product prices. They have their factories abroad in China, India, and Bangladesh, and they are emitting a lot. But these are not counted towards their emissions, and they're not taking responsibility for that. And they're saying, oh, we're clean, we're net zero. So it is really important to include these emissions. And as we know that there's carbon trading, there's carbon tax. What do companies do when they don't have enough carbon budget? They buy factories abroad, abroad so they have their emissions abroad instead of within their country. Um, and the third point I wanted to make is that um, in order to ensure youth engagement, especially in develop, developing countries, we need to invest into education. And that's a really important point to um, empower young people because how are they going to be able to build these um, innovations, these technologies, if they don't have the knowledge? We're investing so much in different um, fuel, fossil fuel subsidies. If we can just take a small portion of this money into building universities in developing countries, not just capacity building session, not just some sort of education program, but actually proper education like universities, we can achieve so much more. Yeah, so that's my three points. No, thank you very much. And I mean, I think this is this clearly also links to the, the previous panel, the, this whole skills conversation, right? 
I mean, one thing is to 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 uh, foster sort of um, creation of universities, but it's also sort of like what kind of education, right? We are providing, right? And I think this is, I think, very often. Mm, I feel forgotten because we say, okay, give us money, give us technology, but then, you know, this is very often a different department dealing with that. So thank you very much for, for, for those thoughts. And I think let's move on now to Mike Coffin, who is, I think Mike, I understand you are newly appointed, right? Head of uh, oil, gas and mining at Carbon Tracker. So one of the co-hosts, great to have you here. Mike has uh, been working on transition risks within oil and gas industry and the global energy system. Uh, we discussed, you know, the, the transition risk is something, one of the key topics um, in, the, in the transition phase of conversation. So we discussed that it would be nice if you could comment on the transition risk in the North Sea, but at the same time, when we heard that, we have to go immediately, while we are not done with North Sea, we have to already start discussing, you know, other non-annex one producers, where those risks are completely different, and I, uh, I can imagine they are much deeper. So if you could just shed some light on, on, on those two uh, aspects that would be fabulous. I see. Thank you. Um, so at Common Tracker, I mean, our, our focus is looking and identifying transition risks, and we, we primarily do that for an investor audience. Um, but actually, in a, a piece of work we've done over the last year is really trying to understand some of our work and put it more into a policy context. Now, one of our a, a sort of key themes is understanding, um, ultimately, uh, the, the sanction of projects that are that ultimately not needed as the move uh, the world moves away from oil and gas and and we see that uh, that change is being increasingly inevitable and clearly has to happen for us to stick to the goals of the Paris Agreement and limit uh, global uh, warming to, to 1.5 degrees. Now the IEA was very clear on this that we can have no new project sanctions for, for us to be able to achieve that. Now that doesn't mean any no new product no production from oil and gas. What it means is we can have no sanction of new projects and we allow the existing production to wind down in an orderly fashion uh, over the coming decades. And I think it's really important to draw the distinction between those two things. Now, what does that leave in terms of transition risks? Well, if you're a company or, or a nation who are currently complicit or in sanctioning new projects, ultimately committing, com the committing of capital uh, to projects um, potentially with, with lives of 20, 30 years, Ultimately, as we move away from oil and gas, those projects run the risk of ultimately not being needed and destroying value for shareholders uh, and taking the world beyond Paris limits. So, so the, the interests of shareholders or investors and environmentalists and, and global society are very much aligned. Now, what are the, the risks here in the North Sea? Well, we've heard clearly Gen Denmark's journey and moving away from, from oil and gas and, and for the UK and, and for Norway, that kind of the experience is similar, you know, in, in in the UK, for us to be credibly aligned with net zero 1.5, we need to not allow any future sanctions of oil and gas projects. And we just keep the existing projects that there are and allow those to, to wind down naturally. So for example, we have the Cambo field that's being potentially being sanctioned. Again, that, that field is not compatible with a 1.5 degree world. It's not even compatible with, with a well below two degree world either. So I think it's critical that, that uh, society and investors alike get behind kind of now, if we think a little bit more broadly around some of, some of the transition risks, and we look at the experience of, of, of the, the three countries we have today, only one of those three, Norway, would we view as a, a petrostate. And, and we, looked at the, um, we looked at the petrostates earlier this year in a report we called um, Beyond Petrostates, where we looked at the 40 countries globally that are most dependent on oil and gas. And of these, only Norway um, of these three today uh, was part of that group. But even in Norway, it's a relatively small proportion of global, uh, sorry, of government revenue and government income comes from the oil and gas sector. But if we look more broadly within that petrostate group, particularly for countries, for example, like Angola, Nigeria, um, Azerbaijan, um, some of those countries, a significant proportion or more than half of total government revenues come from oil and gas. Now, be that broad taxation of listed company activities or direct investments and in indirect um, generation from national oil companies. Now, as the world moves away from oil, be that through policy action or through uh, out competition by renewables, so the rapid rise of solar and, and wind, those revenue streams will fall. So this isn't about what fuels these uh, countries use for their domestic energy supply. This is around a reliance on ex oil and gas exports for their um, national income and ultimately the transition risk over the next two decades, huge fiscal sustainability challenges. We calculated $13 trillion of national income is at risk over the next two decades. Now, this is a huge challenge for that group of 40 petrostates. 
And, and really the point of our research, just really to wrap up, is that it's critical we raise awareness of these, these issues now. And these countries and governments prepare for this orderly transition and don't double down on continued oil and gas investment. Um, locking in um, you know, reliance on oil and gas revenues for, for decades to come and ultimately exacerbating that financial risk. We need the countries to move away now. And it's critical that other countries learn from the experience of petrostates and don't, we, we group this uh, a group of countries such as the emerging petrostates, for example, Mauritania, um, Mozambique, Guyana, countries such as those that, that don't follow that path of the petrostates and ultimately look to build their economies around far more sustainable industries. And crucially, it's in the interest of the international community as a whole um, to support these countries in moving away in a just transition, um, reframing the roles of national oil companies, taxation reform and legal reform. And so we can build on the experiences of countries such as Denmark that have started this journey and ultimately use those experiences to help accelerate the transition of these other, country, uh, other countries throughout the world. Anyway, I'll pause there. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to offer a chance to our audience, uh, maybe to ask a question or two. Uh, I see, yeah, maybe we just take those two. First this one and then immediately the following one and then we see what happens with time. Please be short and introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Pierre Anke Nielsen from the Norwegian Confederation of Enterprise. Um, this discussion also goes uh, in, a, on, in Norway. And uh, my question is, uh, have you considered that uh, uh, part of the transition can be to make oil and gas emission free? Uh, you know, that's also a path that we work uh, uh, very much on. And uh, an argument for do doing that is that uh, the dependency of fossil fuel is not going down in the world. And we have very little time. And for every year we fail on the COP to agree on anything, the need for CCS, CCUS, whatever, just increases. Thanks. Thank you. And then the following question here immediately, let's just take it. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Musa Abdullah Hilom from Nigeria. Um, I just want to comment and ask a question on what the third speaker uh, panelist said with regards to the oil companies who are operating in uh, Africa. For example, Shell, as she said, I don't understand because when they operate in Europe, they comply, but in Africa or in Nigeria, they do not comply at all. So what do we do about that? That's my question. What do we do about that? Because if you are saying like Denmark have gone very far and all those uh, oil companies working within Denmark must comply. But when they leave Denmark and come to a country like Nigeria, they do not comply. What do we do about it? How do you tackle that? Thank you. Thank you very much. Two very easy questions. So who, who would like to <laughs> take a crack? Uh, maybe Gokche and I imagine Mike, right? Yeah, if you'd like to yeah. answer. Thanks for the question. Um, so I, I think it's no secret that majority of the emissions uh, from oil and gas comes from consumption. Um, so our project, and we are also aware that we are using oil and gas today, uh, but we're talking about a managed transition. And I really recommend that, uh, that you have a look at our production gap report that SEI produces together with uh, several um, other organizations, including UNEP. Um, because the, the advice is that we need a managed transition um, and production and demand, they need to, they need to go down hand in hand. So that, that is uh, crucial. Yeah, sure, absolutely. I'll just do a quick round. I've got the mic, you can't take it off me. Um, it was just a very brief point on your, your question around the role of CCS and CCUS. It's an ongoing debate. I think it's a debate necessary and worth having. And it's a debate that we as academics can also engage with. It was reflected earlier in the discussions briefly, but we are not necessarily here just to set the stall and say, this is it, this is the right way, this is the only way. But I certainly see myself as an academic as gathering perspectives from those that are interested in CCUS, CCS, those who want phase out tomorrow, those who want phase out 2060, 2050, and trying to come together or aid the coming together of people with different perspectives to try and create a future in which any number of those parts may play, may, might play a really important role. And so I personally would say maybe. 
Um, but let's have a wider discussion. Let's facilitate this discussion and then maybe come back in the next COP26 and present research findings on <laughs> who agrees that it should be part of the puzzle and who agrees that it shouldn't. But also, you know, making sure that that happens in a way that is policy ready and policy actionable. Because I, I think a number of us would be frustrated about the amount of discourse that happens without any action. Um, and so if we're taking stall at this point and saying, we don't yet know enough, we don't yet know which stakeholders support that role of that technology and which don't, um, and we haven't come together with that deliberative future, then let's actually promise that we do it next time. And therefore that we come with pieces of recommendation um, that fall out of making that future happen. I don't know, Lydia, would you like to add something or I, if not, then it's fine. We can just move on. Yeah. Um, just to the question about Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I'm not a politician, but there's three things that I can think of. One is climate action. So just to raise, raise awareness in general about what is happening in Nigeria, what is happening in the developing countries. And secondly, there's a lot of startups on energy. I'm building uh, renewable energy in developing countries. And it's really hard, hard for them to receive funding. So take, for instance, fintech. They're, rece they're receiving a lot of funding easily by governments, by investment banks, Goldman Sachs, Silicon Valley. Why? It's because their, their work is soft work. It can be comfortably done behind a computer. But for the energy companies, energy startups, they need to have on-ground work. And that's why it's really hard for them to receive funding. So this is an area that we can work towards too, to get more funding for these energy projects that are actually making a real difference in those countries. And thirdly, I think youth inclusion is also a very, very important part because the youth is going to be the next generation of policymakers, of, um, of engineers. So we need to include youth right now to let them learn what's going on and educate them, invest into education to empower youth and take the, step, um, take the steps into energy transition. Thank you very much. So Mike, last word, uh, oil and gas transition emissions fee or, or whatever was the question, please. Yeah, so I think to answer those two questions in order, I mean, on the first one about decarbonizing oil and gas or carbon free or uh, low carbon oil and gas, I mean, the, the reality is we have a massive challenge to move away from oil and gas and decarbonize the world rapidly. So we need all the tools in the toolbox. So carbon capture and storage, utilization and or storage may be one of those tools that helps, but let's not rely on it. And if we're going to use it, let's only use it for the hardest to abate sectors. Let's not use it to justify the status quo, continued production of oil, the ground transportation, where there are reliable and um, rapidly decreasing cost alternatives such as wind, uh, solar, hydrogen, and electrification. Let's look at that opportunity. Let's not just rely on it to justify the status quo. Um, I think that I'd be very clear on that. A technology CCUS that is ultimately totally unproven at anything like the scales that would need to be uh, delivered in order to, to, to justify ongoing um, oil and gas or is invoked by many of the, the, the leading or the largest, sorry, companies' plans. I mean, there's a huge disconnect between what has been demonstrated to date. And it's not that it's a new technology. It's been around for a while. We just haven't got it to work at anything like the scale we need. So let's not rely on it at all. So and, and the second question really about, I mean, it is really about um, multinational country uh, companies acting in um, you know, non, their non-home jurisdiction. I think there are a number of different areas. Clearly, there's one around strengthening legal reform in the local uh, uh, countries, understanding uh, understanding what those laws are and sharing those laws more widely. And I think if you take an example, perhaps of a spill um, in a, a local country, as opposed to the regulation be under, say, in, back in the UK, um, understanding those regulations, making sure investors are aware of those regulations. But it's, it's about transparency, sharing, ensuring those companies are sharing details and publishing details of where they have transgressed. And I think a final element uh, on that would be around stock market listings. So if those companies are listed in, in European or North American stock markets, they need to be held account for their actions, not just in, in those jurisdictions, but for their actions worldwide as well. So I think the transparency and the legal framework around their, their stock masking listings, and whether that's the, the, the largest companies or, or smaller companies too, I think for me, that's a really important avenue and ho hopefully, yeah, hopefully that's a good answer to that. 
Perfect. Thank you very much. We have I have a radio control watch here, so it's 30 seconds left. So I think it's just the time to conclude. I want to thank uh, the second panel, but I also want to thank the Danish government for hosting us here, State of Green, uh, SEI, Carbon Tracker, and a big shout out also to my colleague Adriana, who has been tirelessly putting together this event. Thank you so much. And I think uh, I'm going to invite everybody here and also, you know, watching us uh, live um, in the web to just stay engaged and, you know, come to us and, you know, propose jurisdictions ideas because we are planning to work on, on the subject for the next, hopefully, few years. Thanks again and have fun for the rest of the COP and all your journeys home if you're traveling back home. Thank you again. Thank you, guys.